guys, Anila and I, we work together hand in hand, so deeply, so committedly. We realize we are the leaders we've been waiting for. Thank you so much, Sula. Um, remember, we have it all come together. Just understand what we want to address. Take heart, because our silence is not going to save us. Thank you. And also, amnesia is unacceptable. Amnesia is our worst enemy. Um, you know, yes, Ahmad, I was going to get to you because for two reasons. One, you can continue what Soraya was saying, but the second one, we spoke, when you and I spoke, about the plight of women under Hamas in Gaza. Could you please elaborate on how much women were actually suffering in Gaza under Hamas before October 7th? Certainly, and I just wanted to pick up on a point you mentioned about the silence. Is one of the things that genuinely and sincerely sustains me, despite the continuous challenges and the hatred and the attacks and the attempts to marginalize me or delegitimize me or paint me as a Zionist sellout or a CIA asset or a Mossad agent or this, this, that. Every day it's a different charge. There's, there are hundreds, and I mean literally hundreds on a monthly basis of Arabs, Muslims, Palestinians that I hear from on social media, in person, etc., who tell me, thank God you're saying what you're saying. We believe it, we want to say it, but unfortunately we can't. I'm, I have a family, I'm part of a sprawling Muslim community in the United States, or I'm, you know, I'm, my family are still in Gaza, etc., etc. So I, 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 I take inspiration from the fact that there are many who are silently in agreement. Now, the goal is to try to bring some of them out of the shadows. The goal is to say, okay, I can maybe understand if you're in the West Bank, or if you're in Gaza, or if you're in some other place that you know, it's difficult. You're dealing with the daily realities of life under those circumstances. You have Hamas, you have communal pressure. But if you're in the United States and you're bullied into silence in this unhelpful way, there's a threshold beyond which I start to lose my empathy. Or I don't want to use the word empathy. I'm all about empathy. I start to lose my patience, I should say, for you to not actually speak out, to not leverage your presence. Your Western privilege. That is Western privilege that we have a role and a duty to use, which is the privilege of freedom of speech, the privilege of having safety, the privilege of having our basic necessities met. So I absolutely work with this theme of silence and, and what it means and where it's coming from. Um, as for your earlier question, I mean, no doubt, and, and, and as part of trying to hold, like, be nuanced and be accurate, on the one hand, Hamas isn't straight up the Taliban or ISIS in the sense that they are not as, as fascistic as some of these Islamist terror groups. On the other hand, Hamas has adapted a more sophisticated, more gradual approach sorry, to Islamize the society. And so one of the first things they did when they took over, and, and my, I got political asylum in the United States when I was 17 years old. Um, on, and the interview took place on June 14th, 2007, which is the very day that Hamas took over the Gaza Strip. And I was one of the first wave of, of Palestinians to seek asylum in the United States from Gaza because of their control. And so later in 2007, one of the first things they did, and I remember having a conversation with my dad about it, is, oh, they came up with a rule that women, uh, because Gaza has beaches, and so there are a lot of, like, hookah lapids and like water pipes and you know, like smoke hookah or whatever, everybody does it. Women cannot smoke hookah in public on the public beach, uh, and, and on the beaches, you know, because that's just like, you know, it's, it's not civilized, that's the word they use. So it was like almost immediate and then they were like, they gave some of the public pushback and then they would roll it back and then, you know, years later, oh, well, actually, we don't want women to leave Gaza through the Rafah border crossing, the passenger crossing, without the approval of a guardian. And, 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 and it started with a guardian for the young women, and then they tried to expand it. Well, it has to be a brother or a father or, or you know, a mahram. Um, and then there was, like, backlash. And then they were like, okay, okay, fine. We're going to push back and then not really. Last year, right before October 7th, there was a young lady that I was helping in Gaza, go to Bulgaria to a scholarship. And, and, and I was like connecting her with another friend of mine who was teaching her English, and how do you go through the airport, and how do you transfer flights, just 
basic. She had never been out of, a, uh, out of Gaza. They met at a coffee shop, and Hamas's morality police, just like in Iran, came up to my friend, and she thankfully made it out of Gaza. They came up to my friend, and the female and the, the male guy, the young guys, and said, oh, like, are you guys together? Are you married, you know? And they were like, no, we're not married. And they were like trying to ask him questions. Why are two single unmarried? And it was like 11 in the morning. And my friend, my male friend, actually escalated with them. And to de-escalate, they just decided to walk away. But take this, and, or, or how, about, how about violence? How about when the honor killings that Hamas not only doesn't prosecute those who commit those, but actually allows, for example, there are other things, for example, when it comes to splitting of the inheritance because of the Islamic doctrine that Hamas adopts, they codify in the law that women get half of the inheritance of men, and so on and so on and so on and so on. So you have, it's like death by a thousand paper cuts. It's like threads upon threads of, you know, entrapping women into this Islamization of the society. And Gaza, by the way, I know people find it, my family, I come from a pretty conservative Muslim family. My, my mom and siblings and all and sisters and all cover up and wear the hijab. They're very committed and devout Muslims. But in the 70s, and, and like even up into the early 80s, there, there are pictures of my aunts and my mom in skirts and in, in pants and in like cuts and stuff like that. This started in the early to mid, mid, mid 1980s with the Mujamma Islami, the Islamic complex. And it, that's how you hear about Hamas having the social services. And it creeped up to political activism. Then it creeped up to militant activism. And so unfortunately, the women of Palestine in general, but especially the women of, of Gaza, over, I would say, a three and a half decade period, have suffered from the Islamization of society in a way that is inherently inconsistent with Palestinian culture and Palestinian values that were largely secular. Yes, Islam was a big part of the Palestinian national identity, but it was always as, as something that goes along with the national identity, not this like, oh, we are Muslims first and then Palestinians. And I'll conclude with this just on this, like, and that's the thing about Hamas, is from the very beginning, they, they said it out in the open, mainline headlines, we don't care about Palestinian identity, we don't care about the Palestinian state, Mahmoud al zahar and I was in Gaza when all these leaders, these disgusting leaders were there. He would say, oh, I, this, the Palestinian flag is like a little toothpick. He, had this, he said that in 2007. It was only after the Palestinian National Project hit a roadblock that Hamas decided, all right, we're going to rebrand from pure Islamism to be national Islamists. And so that's why you started having the Nuzma, the Hamas's elite fighters that committed those horrendous atrocities on October 7th, when they actually still wore uniforms, not like what they do as cowards today. They started wearing, when you saw all the Hamas fighters getting issued the, the Palestinian patch insignia to say that we are nationalist Islamists. So unfortunately, the women of Gaza, just like the, in a, in a different way, have paid a heavy price. Thank you so much, Ayad. You told me we need to wrap it up. So, just very quickly, I want to go through every one of you. What should this film leave with us in terms of what we need to do, each one of us, what we need to do next to make sure that we're doing our part? But really leave it for one sentence. Go ahead. I'm going to answer this question as a Jew, as an Israeli citizen, that what this film did for me, that reminded me that if I'm not the owner and the narrator of my own story, someone will take it from me, and it is my duty to continue to talk about this movie, to talk about these women, and to when I walk into a room of women's rights organizations, that I don't leave those two parts of me outside, and I insist that people look me in the face and recognize what my people are going through, what these women have gone through, and I'm not going to back down. Well, I think everybody in this room can play a role. Uh, education, as I said before, is the road to peace and understanding. There is denial not just of the women's rape issue, but there also is denial of everything. The, the posters being taken down, the, the whole experience, the whole Jewish-Israeli experience. So you have a role. You can educate. You can post. You can repost. Uh, and if you're on social media, if, if not, you can write a letter to the editor. You can pick up a pen. You can put
put your hands on this. You can make sure that every single one of your friends sees this film and other films that are relevant. So pick up a pen. Make sure that you take a roll here. Join us. Eight hundred people were executed in Iran last year. That's what the UN repertoire told us last week on the Hill. Just for saying what they believe in, for not wearing a hijab or a dupatta or whatever. Eight hundred people were executed. Why? Two thousand. If they're saying eight hundred, might be two thousand. Why is there selective outrage? Why didn't people speak up for Masa Amini, who had the courage to do what she believed in? Why aren't we talking about the Uyghur women who just had a conference in New York and said, listen to us, we are also Muslim and we're hurting. Why don't we talk about Rohingya women? Do you know, thousands and thousands of them were raped. They are still trafficked and sent to all parts of Asia but we are just concerned with Israel. That has to stop. This selective outrage has to stop and we all need to demand that Seema Bayou, Bayou Bahus, who's the UN Women's Chief, has not condemned the violence of Hamas against Israeli women. She doesn't even believe it. She needs to resign and we must call for her that. My, my tax taxpayers, dollars and laws cannot go to building tunnels and refusing to acknowledge the pain of women. I'll, I'll keep it short. I think uh, yeah, please, everybody. We, we just need, <laughs> we need a political and civic engagement hall for Muslim Americans that are not anti-Semitic, that are not with the grievance narrative, and that are a counter to care and is not an enough what's sitting in Washington, D.C. today is a danger. The Muslim-Jewish relations, the history of them in the United States has always been on caveats and battles on Zionism and the existence of Israel. And so we need to change that. So we need a seat at the table, and we need to be in Washington, D.C. Be a role model. Show that you can hold multiple truths at the same time. Even as you, if you support, or as you support, or if you support Israel, even if you wish the destruction of Hamas, and believe me, I'd love to wake up tomorrow and find Hamas gone. Try your best to think of the humans on the other side. Think of the people of Gaza that are suffering due to circumstances over which they have no control. If you model that, if you exhibit that, you show that you are the better person, even if it's not reciprocated. You do what's right, not expecting something good in return, and I promise you that will plant seeds for transformation. Thank you. So I have, uh, when I met Rachel Goldberg in Tel Aviv, uh, she told me about her, her son Hirsch, who had many Muslim friends, but not one person contacted her. And I told her I will remind about her son at any gathering that I come to and I speak at. And so I want you to remember her son. And when I met Amit uh, in, in DC, she, I asked her, what is the message you have for the world? She said, talk about us so that people will hear. And I, my request to you is, there are 650 million Muslims in South Asia. Don't forget that. Don't let the Arab voices take hold of the narratives. So yes, Sorry, yes, please. This is this is urgent. This is important. As Zainab said, we need you to amplify our voices. This is hard for us. They call us. I mean, we are we are a step away from a death threat, but we take a step because we are convinced we are not looking for consensus.